Welcome back. Today we've got wide receivers 13 through 24 for the 2023 fantasy football season. On Tuesday we did 1 through 12, so make sure you check that video out. I'll run through the rankings for you right quick. Start this off with some heat. Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, Tyreek Hill as the three. Cooper Cup, Stephon Diggs, Devontae Adams, A.J. Brown, C.D. Lamb, Jalen Waddell, Amon Ra, St. Brizzy, Brown, Garrett Wilson, and Mr. T. Higgins, which leaves us at wide receiver 13, okay? So we're going to run through the next 12 guys. These dudes are pretty much on the precipice of breaking out. I'm sure there will be a handful of them that end up as wide receiver ones, and they are important to hit on those guys. Otherwise, you've got no no chance. I want to start you off with a little bit of a, a little stat that I heard today on a podcast. Um, I think it was the Fantasy Pros podcast, and they had a guy that did an article on their website last year, so this is not take into account 2022's statistical numbers, but from 2012 to 2021, which is a 10-year span, there were an average of more than seven different wide receiver ones in PPR year over year. So each year, on average, there were seven new guys that came into the wide receiver one landscape in PPR leaks. During that span, 11% of the new wide receiver ones were rookies. 20% of the new wide receiver ones, like first-time wide receiver ones, came from second-year players. 34% came from third-year players. 16% came from fifth-year players. I'm not sure why they skipped the fourth-year stat in that one. Maybe it was just a very low number, but you're seeing uh, 65% of wide receiver ones come within their first, second, or third year. These are the guys that you should be targeting very heavily if you just weigh the averages right there. If you grab somebody within the first three years, it's more likely that they fill up those wide receiver one start statistics rankings than the guys that are out of that. And obviously, we have more of a sample size of the guys who already haven't hit, so it's less likely that they do. But sometimes, uh, fifth year maybe makes sense because a lot of the guys that get drafted have four-year contracts. They end up with a new team in the fifth year, new situation maybe more targets, etc. It doesn't really fucking matter. So if you enjoyed today's video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you go watch the running back rankings videos from last year. But more importantly, subscribe to the channel because we've got some of the BDGE crew and other members coming out to New York City uh, this weekend. They're flying out Thursday. They'll be here through Sunday. We're going to make a ton of content. We're going to be doing a ton of live streams. we got no more parties coming out to New York. Obviously, Tony and Sexy are here. Alex Caruso's coming out here. Uh, J. Allen Simon from Front Yard Fantasy. So the HQ will be packed out, which means we will be ripping content, live streams recorded for next week, all that kind of stuff. So make sure you're subscribed. Got notifications on because we're going to be doing multiple underdog draft streams throughout. So 18-round draft. 18 round mock drafts to get you prepped for the summer and your best ball leagues etc make sure you're in the discord because that's where we'll be dropping the links to stream if you want to join the drafts um, and then obviously make sure you are on underdog so download the app use promo code bdge we'll get you a 100 percent deposit match y'all know what we're doing next we're talking y'all didn't think there was going to be a hoodie jean tuck combo today did you we're out for heads today all right <laughs> Number 13, continuing on to the list, is Devontae Smith of the Philadelphia Eagles. Again, I think you could probably throw him into the tier really as high as like wide receiver 10, definitely up in the 11 range. If you want to argue him as a low-end wide receiver 1, I'm, I'm with it uh, on a full basis of last year he finished as a wide receiver one technically if you look at points per game he was outside he was more of like a high-end mid wide receiver two the dude is just phenomenal at football like the great senior year at Alabama like the historic senior year at Alabama people were questioning whether or not it was real if he was going to be good at the NFL level great rookie season 104 targets 64 catches 916 yards five touchdowns follows it up with a phenomenal sophomore year so every year he's just done great fucking things on a football field and gotten better and better and better and better. Kind of reminds me of his quarterback, Mr. Jalen Hurts, okay? Sophomore year, last year, 136 targets, 95 catches, 1,196 yards, and seven touchdowns. So you're just talking about a dude who continues to step his game up year over year over year. The two concerns on this offense come from the fact that you have A.J. Brown, who is a pure thoroughbred alpha on the outside, on the other side of Devontae Smith, but also just how run-heavy this team is. They threw the ball on just 50.26% of their plays last year, 29th in the NFL. They led the NFL with 33.2 rush attempts per game. He also had the fourth best catchable target rate, so 
the fourth highest rate amongst all NFL wide receivers in terms of the targets that he was thrown being catchable. So, you know, maybe you could just say Jalen Hurts is good and he will continue to be in that range, but there's nowhere really to go up from there. So maybe he sees few less catchable targets, fewer fewer catchable targets. That's what I was trying to say there. But I think uh, the more optimistic way to look at this is maybe this is more of this is less A.J. Brown being the alpha and Smith being the secondary guy and maybe 1A, 1B. And when you have 1A, 1B, there are going to be games where that 1B becomes the 1A for that game. They're interchangeable in that way. Because if you look at the second half of the last year, there was some some real there's some real clicking going on. We had multiple mouse pads going on here between Hertz and Devontae Smith, right? In the last eight games of the season, 18 PPR points per game. His targets went from 6.8 up to 9.4. Receiving yards, 53 up to nearly 90, scoring a touchdown every other game, over six catches per game. If you look at week 11 onward, he was higher than AJB in target share and air yard share, okay? So if you look at the makeup of this offense, not much has changed this offseason, right? They lose Miles Sanders, but they bring in both Rashad Penny and DeAndre Swift. Uh, Alameda Zacchaeus, whatever comes in. Talked about that a little bit with AJ Brown on last week's episode or Tuesday's episode. I feel phenomenal about Devontae Smith's floor. I feel phenomenal about his his floor. Uh, does split the field with AJ Brown again? Run heavy offense. I, I I feel really good about having Devontae Smith on my team. We'll put it that way. Absolutely not a fade by any stretch of the imagination. Where he's going in drafts. I think the question is, uh, can Hurts, AJB, and Devontae Smith be this year's Tua, Waddle, Tyree Kill? Like that's kind of where I'm looking at the situation. And I think the answer is not like for sure, yes, but I think there is a possibility that is in the range of outcomes for sure, where AJ Brown is like the wide receiver three, Devontae Smith is the wide receiver seven or eight, and obviously you're happy with that if you pick him outside of the first twelve wide receivers. DK Metcalf, ninety catches, ten forty eight yardage, six touchdowns. Another dude I have kind of trouble projecting for more than what he had last year. Like, you add all these playmakers to the offense and JSN and Zach Charbonnet, and I can't really make a great argument for DK getting more work than he did last year. Like, obviously, it's easy to say, oh, JSN's just going to play the slot, but, like, targets are targets. If JSN ends up with 100 targets, those have to come from other play, uh, other places, you know, and the other guys that are going to be on the field are going to be DK Metcalf, and they're going to be Tyler Lockett. So it's cool to be like, oh, he's taking these guys' targets, but when he's on the field, he's taking the dude's targets that are on the field, if you know what I'm saying. We need more deep shots to DK Metcalf to really unlock that upside, which can definitely be the case now that JSN is occupying the slots. Like He, he only had two games last year over 90 yards in the regular season. I'm excited about Geno Smith. I think like he is definitely their quarterback for the time being, and he's way more than serviceable. Like the same way I would look at, you know, like a Derek Carr. I think that's how Geno Smith is right now for DK Metcalf. I, I feel really good about his floor again. I feel good about him being like a low end wide receiver one, probably more so high end wide receiver two, which is why I have him right here. And 15, Chris Olave. New Orleans Saints. He's one of those dudes that, like, end of the year, we look back. If he's, like, the wide receiver seven or eight, no surprises there. And I think you could probably make the argument to throw him above DK Metcalf uh, just based on probably ceiling. I think you could probably make the argument. I think he's another one of those guys where it's just you're not going to be disappointed by taking T. Higgins or Amon Ra or Alave or Devontae Smith. Like, they're all really good players that have really, really high floors. Who hits the ceiling? I don't know. When you look at him statistically, Nearly 120 targets last year, 71 catches, 1,042 yards as a rookie, four touchdowns in 15 games. So his statistics would have been even better had played the full 17, obviously. He was kind of like Amon Ross St. Brown in terms of his like individual game logs, but he actually saw deep targets. Like These were actual game logs from Chris Olave. He was doing the same thing every single week. 5 for 80, 4 for 67, 4 for 54, 5 for 52, 6 for 71, 5 for 62. So he, he had basically like... Every one of his games was between 50 and 80 yards and between four and six catches for the most part. But again, what excites me is the fact that he saw a ton of deep targets and he pretty much is the only deep weapon on that team. I'm Rashid Shahid, no, I don't want to disrespect him. I actually like him. 27 deep targets last year for Alave, which was 12th in the NFL. Only had seven catches on those 27 deep targets, so 25.9% catch rate, which was 82nd of 100 qualified wide receivers. He only had one drop which means a lot of bad throws, but he did only come down with two of nine contested catches on those deep targets, which means he needs to do better there. Fifth most unrealized air yards in the NFL from a quarterback in Andy Dalton who ranked 24th in deep ball attempts. So you're talking about Derek Carr coming in. I think he's going to throw it deep far more than Andy Dalton did and do it more accurately. So I'm excited for Derek Carr joining the Saints as it relates to Chris Olave. He came out as a supreme route runner from Ohio State, and he did not disappoint in year one. If you look at the 
reception perception profile from Matt Harmon that he did on Chris Olave in year one. 83rd percentile versus man, 73rd versus zone, 83rd versus press coverage. Like, he is phenomenal. I think if people liked his profile more, like he didn't stay all four years at Ohio State, you know, whatever, and he was outproduced by some of these younger guys, he'd be like a first-round dynasty fantasy football pick in a startup draft with these types of numbers. You had a guy who went for over 1,000 yards as a rookie. You have a guy who's separating and hitting these 80th percentile separation uh, rates versus coverage. You you're, you're probably look at him as, as a little bit of a def, uh, different player. And like I said, Derek Carr attempted deep passes at a 4% higher rate than Andy Dalton did last year. Over the course of 500 pass attempts, 600 pass attempts, that's, you know, 20 to 30 more deep attempts. And that's also probably, you know, eight more deep targets for a dude like Alave who takes the majority of those targets. So maybe even more than that. So I'm excited to see if Alave becomes the guy that, you know, Adams was for Derek Carr, where you feed him 150, 160 targets. The Michael Thomas question still at play. We haven't seen him be good on a football field in like three, four years at this point. So I'm not putting a lot of stock into him. I, I, I don't want to read too much into that. Let's start moving a little bit quickly here because this is going to end up being a long one. Yes, I know my eyes fucked up. I don't know what to do about it. It's been like that for like two weeks. It's like a, it's disgusting, but it's like a, there's like a white head. It's like a white head there that I keep popping and it keeps coming back. I don't know what to do. Do I just rip my fucking eye out? Do I just rip it out? At this point, I'm ready. I'm re there, there's no suggestions that I'm above. I'll rip the whole eyeball out. I'll rip my head off just to get this fixed. Amari Cooper doesn't need much fixing, okay, because he's my number 16 wide receiver for the Cleveland Browns. Another guy that I think I could make an argument to rank him as high as like the wide receiver 11 or 12. I really, really believe that. 132 targets, 78 catches, 1,160 yards, nine touchdowns last year. He was the wide receiver nine in fantasy last year. If Watson can get back to what he used to be, uh, Cooper is going to be a screaming value in fantasy drafts. And I, again, I think we need to we need to rank them a little bit higher. They're going to be more pass-heavy this year. They're not going to be the same run identity team that they've been for the last few years with Deshaun Watson now under center. Their entire depth chart behind Cooper is completely unproven, right? It's Cooper, and then it's Donovan Peoples-Jones, Elijah Moore, the rookie Cedric Tillman, David Njoku. Like, these are, it, I think it's just going to be a whole lot of targets for Amari Cooper and David Njoku. And you look at when Watson has his wide receiver one, what he did with Will Fuller, what he did with DeAndre Hopkins. Like, these guys eat in fantasy football. I know they didn't finish the year great between Cooper and Deshaun Watson, but but he's going to be the one there. Again, there's not much of anything proven statistically behind him on the depth chart. So I'm kind of all in on Amari Cooper. Like you're able to get him in the fourth round, sometimes like the early fifth round of underdog best ball draft. So I am all over that, man. I've been drafting a lot of Keenan Allen as well, who is number 17 on this list. This might be like a sucker ranking. It might be time to let go on Allen. I just believe in a lot of what the Chargers are doing over there. Like, they bring in Kellen Moore, and I think that means that this offense won't have Herbert averaging 6.5 air yards per attempt, which was 32nd in the NFL last year. Obviously, with Keenan Allen and Mike Williams being hurt, and if your running back becomes the next best target, then your air yard numbers are going to suffer. Uh, but actually, like, criminal, like malpractice, the fact that he wasn't throwing the ball downfield, considering Justin Herbert's arm. Now, with Quinton Johnson, we'll probably get Allen exclusively in the slot but if you look at the end of last year like Keenan Allen the first the, the entire first half of last year was just washed with injuries like he was cooked and he finally got back on the field through the wild card games last year which is nine games that's more than half a season he averaged 11 targets 7.3 catches 82 receiving yards and he scored four times in those nine games that is 14 and a half half PPR fantasy points that's probably upwards of 18 19 20 full PPR fantasy points per game. I could see him having a resurgence sort of like Larry Fitz towards the end of his year where he already played like 10 years in the league. He started to kind of dip off. Arizona brings in the quarterback, and then he goes for over 100, 108, 109 catches, three straight years in a row, over 1,000 yards, nine to six touchdowns in that range. I could see that being Keenan Allen over the next like two to three years. So I'm still very much in on Keenan Allen. I still think he was a great player towards the end of last year. Still has the quarterback, still has the offense, has the offensive coordinator now to, to keep pace and throw the ball, high pass rate, all that kind of sheesh. Number 18 on the list, we have Terry McLaurin. Another year of the same. Terry's an elite wide receiver with just the opposite of that at quarterback. It's been Carson Wentz, Taylor Heineke, Alex Smith, Dwayne Haskins, Kyle Allen, Case Keenum. It's brutal. 
Despite that, over the last three seasons, he has averaged over 80 catches, 1,120 yards, and five touchdowns. And those are wide receiver two numbers, and I expect nothing less. Like, even if Sam Howell or Jacoby Brissett is the starter for the full 17 games, those are the same level of talent QB-wise that he's been dealing with his entire career. Now, I'll just say, you know, we don't want to take one game sample size, but we're going to do it here because fuck it. Sam Howell played one game last year. He was the guy for one game, week 18. Terry, six targets, three catches, 74 yards, and a touchdown. Howell only threw the ball 19 times in that game. So the six targets were a 31.5% target share. And then you look at Jacoby Brissett. I mean, he force-fed Amari Cooper targets last year while he was the starter in Cleveland. So I don't see the two uh, offenses very different in terms of like the makeup what they want to do, and their number one target being the number one target, like Cooper, Terry McLaurin there. So I think Terry's going to be fine regardless of who is that quarterback, and I think you know what you're getting from Terry. He's a safe wide receiver, too, that you're really hoping he has his breakout year because his talent is indicative of that happening eventually. But he probably won't. But maybe, but maybe, but he's probably not going to. Unless, unless... Number 19, Calvin Ridley. I so highly recommend, if you are a Ridley fan, if you are a Jags fan, if you are just a a football fan in general, go check out the article that Calvin Ridley wrote on the Players' Tribune. Uh, We will link that down below. It's free to read. He wrote it himself personally, released it like a month and a half, two months ago. As soon as I read that piece, I know Ridley's getting a lot of hype right now, but like by the time you guys watch this video, the those reports of how good he's looked at camp have already surfaced, so you're going to act like I fucking did this based on those reports. Not the fucking case. As soon as I read this, I was like, I'm, I'm in on Ridley this year. It's, it's just basically his story of like what he went through with the Falcons, what he went through with his time off from football and all the shit that he was dealing with. Really, really good piece, but... As I said, the rumors and reports and everything out of Jags camp is that the dude is just built different, and I think he's going to be the clear wide receiver one in Jacksonville. The last time we did see Ridley really be himself on the field, it was a long time ago, and with those long types of breaks, there's inherent risk baked in with fantasy. You know, oh, do they have their legs under them? Are they the same player? Or do they have the same speed? Did they take care of their body in the offseason? Are they mentally still there? They still got that dog in them. You know, all those things do factor into it. I'm still excited about the return, man. As a pure separator and a route runner, I think he's going to be uh, Trevor Lawrence's top target pretty quickly. And I think Jacksonville is absolutely going to let Sunshine spin this year, man. This is It is Trevor Lawrence's team now. The first year was an abomination. Last year was like him getting his feet under him. And then, you know, the last month of the season or whatever, it was fucking lights out for Trevor Lawrence. And it is now him entering his prime, him becoming the prospect that we had hoped he was going to be this entire time, all throughout college, back to high school. Like, this is T-Law time. And I'm all in on taking the chance on Calvin Ridley this year. I think the upside is super fun. If he finishes as, like, the wide receiver seven, would not be surprised whatsoever. So I would grab as much Ridley as you possibly can this year. Number 20, Drake London. I don't know what the passing game is going to look like in 2023. I really, really don't. But as most rookies do, they progress over the second half of the year. They become better players. They They put up more production. They become statistically better. And if you look at the second half of the year for Drake London, as opposed to the first half, he was averaging over double-digit half PPR fantasy points per game. He averaged nearly five catches a game, seven and a half targets, over 62 yards per game. Didn't score a lot of touchdowns because that was the way that the Falcons offense was built. But he got a ton of fucking volume. 29.4% target share last year per player profile or fifth in the NFL. And I'm looking at it like the Falcons threw the ball 415 times last year. If you look at that target number, right, 29.4% in terms of target share. If you were to spread that out amongst certain numbers of pass attempts, right, if you take 500 pass attempts and he has a 29.4% target share, these are the number of targets that we're looking at for Drake London. 118, 132, 500 pass attempts would net him nearly 150 targets, 550 pass attempts over 160 targets. Obviously, that's extremely optimistic given it's Desmond Ritter and it's Arthur, Arthur Smith, and they drafted Bijan Robinson, but he was 11th in yards per route run last year. He was 14th in fantasy points per route run last year. I'm expecting Drake London to continue to ascend as the alpha in this offense. Wide receiver 20 might be a little bit high for him. I don't know where other people have him ranked. I don't think that's that risky to grab him you know, at the end of the fifth round and the sixth round or something like that. Because again, 
the majority of wide receiver ones that break out do come from second and third year players. London obviously fits into that. Nothing about what London did last year and his profile as a player and his separator tells me that maybe he's not the player they drafted him to be in the top 10. So I want to be in on London. I Listen, if he goes, if he starts going in like the fourth round, I'm probably out on him because I'm a little bit weary of like how pass heavy this offense will be. That being said, Super Bowl uh, 53 runs through Atlanta. No debate about it. Christian Watson, going to be a lot of debate about him. He's my 21st ranked fantasy wide receiver. He's obviously a super easy ranking. If if Aaron Rodgers is there, we're ranking him as a top 15 guy, if not like a borderline wide receiver. One the guy went nuts last year. He's already one of the best downfield playmakers in the entire NFL. My concern with him is his route running ability, his tacticianship, if I must. Um, but not everyone needs to be that type of player to really ascend as a fantasy wide receiver. You could be really, really good at other things like he is downfield playmaking ability, and that can pull you a long, long, long way. In games that Christian Watson played over 70% of the snaps last year, which was six games, he averaged 87 total yards, 18.7 half PPR fantasy points, and he scored eight touchdowns, Okay. If you take away all eight of those touchdowns, eight touchdowns in six games, you take away all eight of them, he still averaged nearly 11 half PPR fantasy points per game. That is phenomenal for a rookie. Now, Jordan Love comes in, and the position group is wildly young altogether. You look at Jordan Love's 24, Christian Watson, 24, Romeo Dobbs, 23, Jaden Reed, 23, both of their rookie tight ends, Musgrave and Tucker Craft are 22 years old. Uh, I like what they're doing with the offense. I think Watson is very much the clear alpha here, and now that they have the full offseason and summer to work together and like gain that chemistry and be the guys together, I'm, ex I'm, I'm excited. I'm cautiously excited about Christian Watson. We do obviously have to be concerned about whether or not Jordan Love's any good, but I think he'll be fine. I think he'll be an average quarterback in the NFL, and I think Christian Watson will be fine because of it. He'll have his spike weeks because that's the type of player he is. Is he going to catch nine balls a game? Probably not, but can he finish the year catching seven passes of 40-plus yards? Can he score eight touchdowns? Absolutely. So I like Christian Watson a lot. I don't think he's a guy that we should be fading whatsoever. Wide receiver 22, we got Tyler Lockett of the Seattle Seahawks. If you look at his last five seasons, okay, one, he has played 16 games in his in the five straight seasons. Half PPR finishes last year, starting from last year and working bikewards. Wide receiver 13, wide receiver 13, wide receiver 8, Wide receiver 14, wide receiver 15. He's been the wide receiver 15 or better in five straight seasons. His current underdog ADP is wide receiver 31. Again, they add JSN. Going to hurt him a tiny bit, but I still I think he's fine. I think he's a guy that you're probably drafting near his floor. He's a guy that never fucking gets hurt. He's more efficient. He's been more efficient than DK Metcalf has. And I have no concern about him breaking down because he hides from contact. He has played in 125 of 130 games since entering the league and again has played in 16 games in six straight seasons. He's turning 31 in September, but the man does not get hurt or hits. All right, so JSN has a slot role. I think Tyler Lockett will be ultra. Do I think he's going to be a top 15 fantasy wide receiver? No, but I think you're getting a guy at wide receiver 30 who will likely finish somewhere in the 22 to 25 range. And if you're grabbing him in the 7th, 8th, ninth round of drafts, I like that value. He's just someone that you could expect to have, you know, five boom weeks, maybe a few bad weeks, but, like, you know what you're getting at the end of the year. Wide receiver 23, Christopher Godwin, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I have not heard him or Mike Evans talked about, like, whatsoever. And this is with the assumption that Baker Mayfield is under center. If Baker Mayfield's under center, I don't hate Chris Godwin at all, all right? In my, in my opinion, like... Baker Mayfield, any other, any quarterback now being under center hurts Mike Evans far more than it hurts Chris Godwin because Chris Godwin is the slot guy. Chris Godwin is the yak guy. Chris Godwin is the guy who makes plays with his speed, his athleticism, get the ball in his hands, by the line of scrimmage, let him do his work, okay? doesn't take a good quarterback to be able to get the ball there. Godwin last year, 104 catches, 1,023 yards. His efficiency numbers weren't great, but I think, I, I think people need to remember – that like all summer, we weren't even sure if Chris Godwin was going to be on the field, if he was going to be on the pup list, if he was going to miss the first eight weeks of the season. He was coming back from the very late season ACL tear. So I'm willing to discount his efficiency numbers, his explosion. Anything that you saw last year, yeah, it's easy to be like, oh, he's not separating great. Yeah, he's like fucking eight months removed from an ACL tear. He was barely ready to play. He played in week one. He forced himself to play in week one, re-injured his shit, and needed three more weeks to rest and recover. And then he was finally like kind of ready to go. And you know what happens? The second half of last year when he started getting healthier, look at the splits 
in split versus out of split. Out of split on the right side is second half of the year. The target numbers stayed the same pretty much. 9.3 targets versus 9.6 targets. But look at the efficiency numbers. Half PPR goes up by 5 points. Full PPR goes up by nearly 6 points. Receptions go from 6 to 7.8. Targets stay the same. Touchdowns, he scores far more of them. Receiving yards goes up 20 receiving yards per game. I just You can't overstate just how impactful that ACL tear was and how easily people forgot about it. Chris Godwin's going to be fine. When you look at Baker Mayfield, those four years he spent in Cleveland, even the years when OBJ came and was supposed to be like the alpha, the leading receiver every single year, except for the year Jarvis Landry missed like four games and DPJ beat him by like fucking 40 receiving yards. But it was Jarvis Landry every single time leading the team in receptions, receiving yards, and targets, okay? And you tell me, who is more like Jarvis Landry, Chris Godwin or Mike Evans? That's what I fucking thought. Wide receiver 24. This is just like last video where I couldn't actually make up my fucking mind here. It's like Mike Williams should be locked in as a top 24 wide receiver, but I do think the addition of Quentin Johnson hurts him way more than it hurts Keenan Allen because he's going to be a pure outside guy. And who gets a lot of the deep targets out there? It's Mike Williams. Now Johnson gets, you know, 40% of them. That hurts his production there. And if Keenan Allen is healthy, then he's probably the one over Mike Williams. So I think Mike Williams is a good case to be the 24 there. I think Jerry Judy, I think people are like really high on Jerry Judy, even though like they're not baking in the risk of this Denver offense just straight up being fucking terrible again despite Sean Payton being there and Russell Wilson just being absolutely cooked so I have a hard time putting Jerry Judy as a locked in wide receiver too I like DJ Moore as the alpha there in Chicago with Justin Fields I expect Justin Fields to take a huge step up in the passing game I think Christian Kirk earned the right to be uh, a wide receiver too after his like basically wide receiver one season last year Ayuk is interesting Debo Samuel's obviously interesting but I'm like what's going on there at the quarterback position they got a lot of mouths to feed Michael Pittman could be interesting with Anthony Richardson. Uh, I even like Traylon Burks as an argument piece there because I you look at their depth chart, it is fucking disgusting. It is disgusting. And I just don't really see a world where Traylon Burks doesn't see 135 targets. And if you're seeing 135, 140 targets, like, you know how bad you got to be in order to not um, finish as, like, the wide receiver 24? I don't know what's going on with, like, D-Hop yet. He's probably going to be moved, but I'm, I'm – Right now, I'm hands-off on D-Hop until we know what that situation is because if he's staying there, then it's like I even want him less because the Cardinals' offense is going to be terrible. But if he moves, then I think you can make the case for D-Hop or Hollywood Brown because then Hollywood Brown gets an extremely high target share. And I guess like Colt McCoy, if he's the quarterback there, it's not as bad as like some of these other backup quarterbacks if Kyler Murray is obviously not ready to start the season. So there's a lot of players that you can make the argument for. So you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to not make it. You guys let me know in the comment section down below who who should be the wide receiver 24 out of the guys I just named. I'm going to let you rank my 24th wide receiver because I can't do it. I can't handle the pressure. I can't handle the pressure of spitting out a useless fucking wide receiver that's not really going to do anything for you guys in fantasy. Anyways, all right, that's it. Make sure you go watch wide receiver 1 through 12. Go watch running backs 1 through 24. We got them on the channel last week. Uh, we got all the links down below for you. Get on Underdog. Subscribe to the channel. Turn notifications on, and we'll see you today, tonight, and tomorrow. Love you.